So for unit four now, we're, we're, we know about compounds. We know how to put compounds together. We know how to name these compounds. We know about the elements periodic table. And there's a lot of information there. So now we're going to take that information and we're, this unit's going to introduce how to make calculations regarding compounds, uh, how to deal with reactions, chemical reactions, uh, how to deal with calculations in chemical reactions. So uh, I'll be referring to this periodic table here. Uh, let me try and keep one up on my uh, on my screen here so that I, I can refer to it. All right, because we're going to be referring back and forth uh, to the periodic table uh, quite quite often throughout this lecture. Um, so I'll always I'll always be um, if you guys have one readily available. Uh, that would be helpful because I, again, I'm going to keep going uh, and referring to the periodic table for anything that at uh, uh, all these calculations that we'll be making today. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's not a good periodic table. Oh, here's what I got. One. Okay, <clears throat> so when we're looking at uh, the periodic table and we're we're viewing all the information here, you know, uh, is that I could I could easily ask you, you know, what the mass of hydrogen is, and according to the periodic table, you go to the periodic table and we we look at the mass of that. We can see the mass is, is 1.01, 1 .01, um, what we call atomic mass units, right? Nitrogen, 14.01 atomic mass units, oxygen, 16. And we get this information just strictly from the periodic table, right? Here we go. If I want to know how much hydrogen is, there it is. Hydrogen is 1.01 atomic mass units. If I want to know the mass of iron, Right, fifty-five point eight five atomic mass units. But what if I want to know not just oxygen? Maybe I don't want to know oxygen. Maybe I want to know the diatomic oxygen gas. Actually, let me erase this right here real quick. Right, if I want to know the the mass of oxygen, this molecule, well, each one of them weighs. 16.00 atomic mass units, but because there's two of them, well, I'm going to take the 16.00, I'm going to simply just multiply it by two, and I get 32.00 atomic mass units. And this is how much O2 weighs, right? And we're talking about masses. So the atomic mass of, of these, so we're going to simply just call it the, what we call the formula mass. So instead of the atomic mass, this is now the formula mass that we're dealing with because we're dealing with molecules, right? So if we're looking at H2O, well, there's two hydrogens. And according to the periodic table, they each weigh 1.01. .01. <clears throat> And the total mass of the hydrogen is 2.02. .02. There's only one oxygen, weighs 16.00 atomic mass units. We get 16. And then we just add it all up together. We take the 2.02 .02 plus the 16.00, comes out to 18.02. .02, and this is our formula mass for simply just water. right? So our formula mass for water is 18.02 .02 atomic mass units. So let's do something a little bit more complex. Right? Uh, here we have carbon, we also have hydrogen, and we have oxygen. So if I want to know the formula mass of this, well, as far as carbon goes, I have 12 of those. Hydrogen, I have 22 of them. And oxygen, I have 11 of those. Well, according to the periodic table, Carbon weighs 12.01. So for wondering where I got 12.01 from, I simply got it from the periodic table. There it is. 
carbon weighs 12.01 atomic mass units. So I'm not making these up. Some of these I know readily. But if you're ever questioning where I got it, let me know, and I'll, and I'll just kind of remind you. Uh, hydrogen weighs 1.01. And oxygen, if we remember, weighs 16.00. So then we can just go ahead and just simply um, add all of these up now. So we'll just do the, the multiplication on there. Uh, 12 times 12.01 is 144.12. 22 times 1.01 is 22.22. And oxygen would be uh, 11 times 16 is 100. And 76. And now that I have all those masses, I'm going to add all of those masses up. So we end up with 342.34 atomic mass units. And, and I can't just finish here. I can't just put AMU. 342.34 AMU is not enough. Um, I generally I don't I don't round um, generally I don't round uh, unless I'm trying to if I'm doing a calculation uh, I want to be a little bit more accurate I don't want to um, I don't want to round too much you can still you can still if you're just trying to do something quick in your head uh, that it, it is okay to round if you're just trying to get a general answer um, that I you know I don't see a problem with rounding it. Uh, you know, from 22.99 to simply just 23. I, uh, I don't think it's going to lead to any wrong answers. Uh, uh, generally, I won't round in my calculations, but, you know, uh, here, what, what would the difference have been here? Uh, the difference would have been, what, 144 uh, plus 22 plus 176, and we'd still come up with 342 um, AMU, right? So, this will rounding like that will not lead to a wrong answer because when we're when we're taking when you're taking the exam uh, I'm not going to have you know 342.35 342.16 342.21 it's not going to be anything like that uh, if we were taking an exam or you know uh, I'd have something in you know maybe 3.4 uh, 34, uh, 286 point, you know, 17, uh, 191.00. And these would be answers that we would see on an exam, right? And if you round it, you would clearly know that that was the right answer. Uh, I didn't round, but you would know that, you know, it, it, you didn't get exactly what I did because you rounded and I didn't. So it wouldn't lead to a wrong answer. Does that, does that help, Jenny? Yes, thank you. Okay, no problem. All right, so when we're talking about this, but uh, I can't just leave it at AMU because I don't know what this is for. Right? Uh, is this 342.34 AMU of Kool Aid, of uh, gold, of uh, a Snickers bar, uh, kitty cats? I, got, I have no idea, so I do have to finish that off. And I want to make sure that I put what it's for. So C12, H22, O11. So this would be my answer here as far as the formula mass is concerned. Um, here, this one is a little, uh, requires just a little bit more work here. Uh, we have iron here, then we have nitrogen, and then we have oxygen. So when we're looking at something like this, because we have these parentheses here, is that this two is going to distribute to the oxygen, and that two also distributes to the nitrogen. So what we have here, just to make sure we understand, we have iron, plus I have two nitrates. Don't worry about the charge there. Um, so that gives us a total of just one iron. I have these three oxygens and these three oxygens giving us a total of uh, oh, giving us a total of six oxygens. So this two times three would be six. Two times one we have two nitrogens. And then I could just get the masses uh, from the periodic table. So from the periodic table, we have 55.85. Uh, 
Uh, you can definitely round it to 56, that's okay. Uh, nitrogen is 14.01 and oxygen is 16.00. And then we'll just add these all up. So I got 55, oop, 55.85, uh, six times 16, 96. And then we can just simply just add all of those up now. Uh, we add all those up, seven, eight, 179, uh, AMU, and then I will put AMU of iron nitrate. So here would be my final answer here. But it is, it is you, you do have to um, distribute that too to whatever's inside those parentheses. Okay, <clears throat> so um, now comes time to learn a, a new definition. So our new definition is what we're going to consider a, a mole, right? So a mole is defined as 6.02 times 10 to the 23 things. Literally, literally anything can be considered a mole. Anything. So I think I think students get a little intimidated by this and and not really understanding or, or trying to uh, or not able to work with this, uh, but but how we treat how we treat this mole here so um and we could do this in the chat i'll just kind of ask some questions we can do this in the chat you could answer um unmute yourself it doesn't really matter but without telling you a specific number if i said that i had a couple of dogs right if i say i have a couple of dogs well how many dogs do i have Nobody knows? Two, perfect, thank you, Isaac. So if I say I have a couple of dogs, I have two dogs. I never said the number two, but you know when I say a couple, a couple represents two. If I said I had a, a few kitty cats, well, how many kitty cats do I have if I have a few of them? Three. I have three because you know a few is represented by the number three. If I said I had a dozen kitty cats, well, how many kitty cats do I have um, if I have a dozen of them? I have 12. So we use mole the same way. The only a few, a couple, a dozen represent very small numbers. And a mole. A mole is used to represent billions and billions of things, not necessarily atoms, but things. So if, if I have a dozen kitty cats, well, I got 12 kitty cats. If I have a mole of kitty cats, I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23 kitty cats. If I have a mole of pencils, I have 6.02 times 10, 23 pencils. If I have a dozen pencils, I have 12. If I have a mole of them, I have 6.02 times 10, 23. Right. And this is how we treat this mole. This is how we understand how to use this mole. Right. Uh, if I have a couple of Starbucks cups on my desk, well, I got two. If I have a mole of Starbucks cups on my desk, I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23 Starbucks cups sitting on my desk. So uh, a mole can really just be defined as 6.02 times 10 to the 23 things. But we are in chemistry, so there are some specific things that I'd like you to tie this to. So we use this definition of one mole is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23 things. And this is my definition. This is me, like me saying one foot equals 12 inches. And what can I do with one foot equals 12 inches? Well, I can write it this way. I can put one foot over 12 inches. 
or I can put it as 12 inches over one foot. Right? So I have these two conversion factors here. And I could do the same thing with this definition here, is that I could write it as one mole over 6.02 times 10 to the 23 things. Or I can write it as 6.02 times 10 to the 23 things over one mole. And yes, and this is this is uh, chemists are lazy. We're 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 lazy people. And when I write mole M O L, this is equal to M O L E. Uh, you're going to see this in your textbook. You're going to see this me do it. Um, you know, M O L E is just a little bit too much for us to write, so we have to shorten that up, and and we end up just writing M O L sometimes. All right. So when you see M O L. Uh, M-O-L-E, that those are equivalent, they're the same thing. Uh, <clears throat> and again, we are in chemistry here. So since we're in chemistry, there's three key words that I want you to keep in mind. If, if you don't see these three key words, you don't need to use this definition. So if we're ever talking about atoms, if we're ever talking about molecules and a mole is not the same thing as a molecule is it a mole does not equal molecule oh, mole. there we go molecule that those are not the same thing a mole is not equal to a molecule right all right so if we're talking about atoms molecules or particles these are your three keywords that you, you need to use this definition here. Right? If I want to know how many atoms there are of something, if I want to know how many molecules of something I have, if I want to know how many particles of something I have, then we use Avogadro's number here. So <clears throat> here we can answer a few questions here. right? And again, here's my key words, how many atoms, how many molecules, how many moles are in this many molecules. So as soon as I see these key words here, atoms, molecules, or particles, I know that I'm going to need Avogadro's number. I'm going to need Avogadro's number. And when we're doing this, you see, we're, let's turn to the first one here. This is asking us how many atoms are in 2.34 moles of sodium. So in order to use this, we're just going to change these things. And let me use a different color here. I'm going to replace things with atoms of sodium because how many atoms are in 2.34 moles of sodium so i'm just going to replace things and i'm just going to write atoms here so now when i set this up here it's asking me if i have 2.34 moles of sodium well i have to get i have to get rid of mole here so only one of these is going to work here only one of these is going to work and let's see i if i have to get rid of mole when i multiply this my mole has to be in the denominator which means that I'm going to use this definition here because my mole is in the denominator and I want to cross cancel that. So if I put 6.02 times 10 to the 23 atoms <clears throat> over one mole, well, my moles cancel out. 
my moles cancel out, and I can go ahead and simply just calculate it after that. So we put 2.34 times 6.02 times 1023, uh, and we end up with 1.41 times 10 to the 24 atoms of sodium. All right. So it's just a matter, and you can do this, uh, you can change things to anything that we're talking about. Just cross out things, write in molecules. Cross out things, write in particles. All right. And then determine what we need to get rid of. So let's look at it a different way now. All right. How many molecules of sodium chloride are in 1.54 moles of sodium chloride? So I'm simply just going to cross out things. And I want to know how many molecules we have. So I'm going to cross out things, and I'm going to write molecules. And we have 1.54 moles of sodium chloride, which means, again, I have to cancel out the moles. So I need moles in my denominator which means this is going to be the definition that I'm going to use. So here I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules over one mole. And now we can cr cancel out these moles here. Cancel out these moles, and we can go ahead and calculate this. Uh, 1.04 times get 9.27 times 10 to the 23 molecules of sodium chloride. All right. Uh, let's see. Let's look at it one more time here. Oh, let's see. I'm going to have to back it up a little bit. Uh, so here, I'll keep this definition here in the window here. Uh, so let's see. This last one says, how many moles are in of NaCl are in 2.5 times 10 to 24 molecules of sodium chloride? Uh, well, let's go ahead and figure that out. So I'm going to start with this. I'm going to start with the information that they provide me, and they say I have 2.5 times 10 to the 24 molecules. And there's my keyword. So I'm going to cross this out, and I'm simply just going to write molecule, molecules. I'm going to cross that out. I'm going to write molecules. And I notice this time what I have – I need molecules in the denominator now. In order for me to cross-cancel, I need my molecules in the denominator, which means that this is the definition that I'm going to use. This is the conversion factor I'll use. So I'm going to put one mole over 6.02 times 10 to the 23 – molecules. And when we do that math, we got 2.5 times 10 to the 24 divided by 6.02 times 10 to the 23. <clears throat> and we come out with, uh, let's go two sig figs, so we got 4.2 moles of sodium chloride. Uh, let me cancel out here, so we get rid of this. We get rid of this, and we have sodium chloride. So uh, here, if you're doing this at home, if you're using your calculator, this is the answer. If you're getting um, – Let's see, what would it be here? 2.54 times 10 to the 24 divided by 6.02. If you're getting this answer here, 4.2 times 10 to the 46, 
you're not using your calculator correctly, right? Uh, email me, ask me after, you know, Zoom or if we're on a break or something that you're not getting the right answer. If you're getting times 10 to the 46, you're, you just need a little instruction on how to properly input that into your calculator. Your calculator should give you an answer that says 4.15 or 4. Point something. I just rounded it to 4.2 for significant figures. But you should have a, whole, a number that's 4.1, 4.2 ish, right? Somewhere in there that you can round. If you're getting this times 10 to the 46, we need a little bit of assistance getting you to use that calculator um, with scientific notation. All right, so this is a molecule of ethanol, right? Ethanol is uh, got two carbons, six hydrogens, one oxygen, and I'll, I'll kind of, I'll label these out here for you. Uh, so here, the black ones are the gray ones here. These would represent carbon. The white ones, these represent hydrogen. And the red one would represent oxygen. So we have C2, uh, H6, uh, and one oxygen here. And this represents uh, ethanol, as we call it, right? So in one molecule, in one molecule, and this is simply just one molecule here, this contains six hydrogen atoms. So I could write I could write a definition just looking at this image here I can write a definition and I could say uh, in one let me write it in green here one molecule of ethanol contains or instead of saying contains I'm going to put equals equals six hydrogen atoms. So one molecule of ethanol has six hydrogen atoms. And this is a definition I can use, right? Uh, that I could simply say uh, in one molecule, I should say one molecule of ethanol contains two carbon atoms and I have another I have another definition here well I could change things up just a little bit so if I have one molecule and one molecule has six hydrogen atoms what if I make a small change here and I'm gonna instead of well not a small I'm gonna make a, a huge change right um, if I say I have, instead of one molecule, I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules. So I have 6.02 times 10 to 23 molecules of ethanol. And if I have one, I simply have one, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have six hydrogen atoms, which means that I'm going to have, actually, you know what, let me back this up here. I'm going to write one more definition. Uh, one, I missed a definition here, one molecule of ethanol equals one oxygen atom. All right, <clears throat> so if I have 6.02 times 10 to the 3 molecules, so I don't just have one now, I have 6.02 times 10 to 23 of these. Well, how many oxygen atoms does that mean? If I have one molecule, I have one oxygen atom. If I have 6.02 times 20, 23 molecules, then I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23 oxygen atoms. 
uh, if I want to know how many hydrogen atoms, well, I take 6.0 times 1023 and multiply that by 6. And that would give me how many atoms there are. So, but this, nobody wants to deal with this math. I don't want to deal with the math. I don't want you to deal with this math. Um, we know what this number represents. I already told you what this number here represents. If I have 6.02 times 1023 anything, well, that just simply means that I have a mole of it. So instead of writing this huge number here, well, I know what 6.02 times 1023 is. I know that that means mole. So here I could simply just write, if I have one mole of ethanol, this is equal to me having one mole of oxygen. And we can definitely write any of these other definitions here. So instead of instead of calling these molecules now, is when we when we look at this formula, C two H six O. Uh, is that I could say if I have one mole of ethanol, I have two moles of carbon. If I have one mole of ethanol, I have six moles of hydrogen. So we're going to start discussing in terms of moles now is that we're going to learn how to do some calculations and these calculations aren't going to involve atoms or molecules or particles or even atomic mass units is that when we calculate in chemistry we calculate in terms of moles moles of the compound that we have, moles of the elements that we have. So if we go back to, we've already calculated this previously. We already, we already did this calculation uh, <coughs> about a half hour ago when we were looking at this formula c 12 h 22 We've already calculated it and we determined that this is the atomic mass of C12H 22011. This is this is a sucrose. So if I say sucrose, I'm talking about C12H 22011. Um, and we calculated this in AMU. Well, AMU is not a unit that we make calculations with um, as far as reactions go. Is that we're going to try and step away from AMU. And what we're now going to use is we're going to use some other uh, another familiar unit and one that we just learned is that our new unit is going to be what we consider grams, which you guys you guys already know what a, a gram is. It's a metric unit of mass, but we're going to put grams over moles. And it's not a difficult transition to do this. We need to convert AMU into grams per mole. <coughs> well, it's very simple to do this. And there it is, right? Uh, here is my grams per mole. Uh, this is equal to this grams over moles, these represent the exact same thing. Um, what I don't, you're, what you won't see me use, I will not do this. That is, yes, this represents grams per mole, but this is not what I'm going to be using. You will not see this on the exam. You will not see me use this in any calculation. <laughs> so here, this grams per mole here, represents grams over moles. And again, because we're doing calculations, 
is that I will not even use it this way. This is not how I want you to use it. I want you to write it like this. <clears throat> this may take an extra two seconds to write, but it, this will help you so much more in the long run. So if we're going to add up, uh, let's just do a simple one here. We've already done it before. So if we're looking at water, right, and I want to know the uh, formula mass of water, well, I have 2 times 1.01 for the hydrogens. I have 1 times 16.00 for the oxygen, 2.02, 16.00, 16.00. And I add this up and I get 18.02. But I'm not going to put atomic mass units. I'm going to use grams over moles. But I'm going to write it a specific way here. So instead of putting 18.02 uh, AMU, I'm going to write 18.02 grams of H2O over a mole of H2O. And this is how I want you to also write it. Does this mean the exact same thing? Yes, means the exact same thing. But in a calculation, this will wreak havoc on your calculations. If you want to make your calculations easier, take the extra two seconds and actually put grams of whatever it is that you have over moles of whatever substance that you have here. Right? Uh, so do yourself a favor and just write it this way, and your life will be much easier when we're doing calculations. Uh, these next three chapters, Unit 4, Unit 5, Unit 6, all deal with calculations. And if you're using, if you're using this because it's just easier to write, uh, good luck on calculations. Right? <clears throat> so here, we're asked to calculate the number of moles and 4.58 grams of sucrose. Uh, when, when we write it like this, so here's my answer here. We're chemists, right? We get to do a lot of, a lot of things that you would normally think you can't do, but we're chemists. We're allowed to do this stuff, right? This is not the only way that I can write this conversion factor. I could also write it this way. Right? This isn't the only way that I could write this. I could also write this as one mole of C12 H22O11 over 342.34 grams of C12 H22O11. So we can always use reciprocal values here. So what we're going to learn to do is we're going to learn how to calculate um, from moles into grams and learn how to ca calculate from grams into moles. So here, <clears throat> it's asking us to calculate the number of moles. And I've mentioned this before to some students, is that whatever it is that I'm trying to find out, if I want to know the number of moles in something, my moles should be in the numerator, right? Here, numerator, denominator, right? So whatever it is that I'm trying to calculate should be in the numerator. All right, <clears throat> so if I have 45.8 grams of sucrose, well, I need to multiply that. I have to get rid of these grams first off. <clears throat> 
right? So there's two ways I can write this. Uh, what was it that we had? Uh, 342.34. So 342.34 grams of sucrose. over one mole of sucrose, or I can write it as one mole of sucrose over 342.34 grams of sucrose. Well, which one do I need? I have grams in the numerator, numerator and I need to cross cancel it, so I need it in the denominator. So this is going to be the conversion factor that I'm going to use here. I'm going to write one mole and I'm just going to cancel. So these units will cancel out these units. And we're able to just go ahead and simply calculate that out. Uh, we'll go with three significant figures here. So we got point 0 0.134 moles of sucrose. All right, <clears throat> let's get another problem. Oh, was that the only one here? Oh, let me, looks like that didn't come across over. All right, so here, uh, let's come out with a new one here. So let's do, um, So let's calculate uh, the number of grams. So instead of calculating moles, let's calculate the number of grams uh, in 0.125 moles of sucrose, C12, 11. All right, well, we know what our conversion factors are already because we've already calculated this out. So I got 342.34 grams of sucrose over one mole of sucrose. Or I can write it as one mole of sucrose over 342.34 grams of sucrose. All right, so if I'm going to calculate this, I'm going to start with the information I have. So I have 0 0.125 moles of sucrose. And I have to... <clears throat> I have to get rid of these moles of sucrose, which means that I need that in the denominator, which means this is going to be the conversion factor that I'm going to use for that. So I'll put 342.34 grams of sucrose over one mole of sucrose. And we can see these units will cancel out. So these units cancel out these units. Uh, and then we end up with uh, 42.8, sig figs, 42.8 grams of sucrose. And that would be our answer there. So <clears throat> we're going to revisit this topic again. We're going to see this later on in the unit um, in a little while. So let's just kind of recall what we did here. Right? In this problem, we calculated moles of sucrose from grams of sucrose. So we went from grams to moles. And in this calculation, 
we went from moles to grams. So we now have a tool. You now have a tool in order to calculate. So this is something you're going to need to do, all right? In order to calculate from grams to moles or moles to grams, you are going to need the formula mass. Or this time, this was because we're this has moles here. We're going to call this the molar mass. So formula mass, 342.34 AMU. And this is what we consider formula mass. Well, because we have moles here, uh, this is going to be considered the molar mass, right? And there's only one place to get the molar mass from is that you have to go to the periodic table. You go to the periodic table, add up all the carbons, all the hydrogens, all the oxygens, and then we put grams per mole. Right? So again, you do have a pathway. You have a tool that you can calculate from grams to moles, or you can convert moles into grams by using the molar mass that you calculate from the periodic table. Does anybody want to know where I got this value from before I move on? Is anybody unsure where this number came from? If you are, that's okay. I don't mind reviewing where that value came from. Okay, <clears throat> so it looks like everybody understands where that came from. All right, so when we're looking at chemical reactions, trying to understand chemical reactions is that chemical reactions were we're going to be transforming that some substance is going to transform into a new substance. We put we put um, two what we're going to call reactants. We put two compounds together. They react and they form a new substance. And that new substance can either be a uh, we can have a change in color. We can have what we call a precipitate, where uh, if we put two compounds together that are uh, in an aqueous solution that they're, you know, they may look liquid, we call them aqueous, <clears throat> is that we have a solid that forms out of that. Maybe bubbles start to evolve. Maybe the, the solution gets hot. Maybe the solution gets cold. And those are going to be what we're going to consider chemical reactions. Um, physical change is not a chemical reaction. If I, if I take my if I take a piece of ice and I put it on the counter and it starts to melt, well, the ice is water, and if it begins to melt, well, it's still water, right? So that's more of what we consider a physical change, not a chemical reaction. So there is an anatomy to a chemical reaction, right? So if we look at these compounds, if we look at these compounds here that are on the left side of what we this is this is what we call the reaction arrow. This is what we call a reaction arrow here. Anything to the left of that reaction arrow is what we're going to call our reactants. So our reactants are on the left side of the reaction arrow. Anything on the right side is what we're going to consider our products. And we, can, we don't necessarily have to have one product. It's anything on the right side of the reaction arrow is a product. Anything on the left side of the reaction arrow is a reactant. You know, maybe there's two, maybe there's only one. Maybe there's five reactants. Maybe I get one product, maybe I get five different products, right? But it's just, it's anything to the left is a reactant, anything to the right of the reaction arrow is gonna be a product. And there's also another time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna talk about it here, um, is that you may see a reaction arrow that looks like this. 
a reaction arrow that looks like this means that it is a reversible reaction. If you have an arrow that looks like this, uh, you know, consider that a consider that a one-way street is that the reactants are only going to make the products and we're done but in a reversible reaction uh, we can go back and forth the reactions can the reactants can make the products products can revert back into the reactants and that the reaction is what we consider reversible right uh, but if we only see one reaction arrow here it's kind of, kind of messy uh, just consider that a one-way street and we're only going to be making products then we have these little abbreviations. You'll notice these here, right? Is that S would mean that that's going to be solid. G, that means it's a gas. And again, here we have solid. Um, I don't use this normally. What I use is a cursive L. If you see, so if you see me write liquid, I'm going to be writing it as a cursive L, and that would represent liquid. And then we have what we call uh, AQ. AQ is what we call aqueous. Aqueous, aqueous, tomato, tomato, doesn't matter. But here, AQ is what we consider uh, as aqueous. Uh, and this just means that, uh, that it's in a solution. Or I shouldn't say it's in a solution. I should say it's been dissolved, right? Uh, so it's uh, dissolved in water. So whatever we have, if we have something that's in an aqueous solution, it just means that we took some compound and we dissolved it in water. And, and that's going to represent what we call an aqueous solution. So <clears throat> what we need to understand here, let me erase some of this here. So what we're going to I'm going to talk about something real quick uh, that we get from from uh, physics here. So uh, we call this a law of conservation of mass. So the law of conservation of mass says this is that uh, as far as physics goes. Uh, thermodynamics, we, we can't create energy and we can't destroy energy, but we can transform it. I can transform energy, um, but we can't ever create or destroy energy. And from that, we get what we call the law of conservation of mass. I, I can't create mass out of thin air and I can't make it disappear either, right? So when we're looking at reactants, whatever mass I have, in my reactants, I also need to have the same amount in my product. So when we're looking at this, when we're looking at, uh, let me go, let me look at a different reaction. Let me write something else here real quick before we finish that topic. Um, if I write this, I'm going to put one mole of ethanol. one mole of ethanol. And then if I had two moles of ethanol, then I would simply put two moles of ethanol, right? And again, let's say we had four, four moles of ethanol. Well, again, and you'll hear me mention it over and over that chemists are lazy. We need to do shortcuts. We've got to do things better, faster. Instead of writing mole, we, we know what this means. If I, I pipe I, four moles C2H6O, that means four moles of ethanol. But it's not necessary. We don't actually have to write it like that. Is that I could just put this. And this would also represent four moles of ethanol. If I wanted to write two moles of ethanol, I would just simply write two. Here, uh, I don't even need to put the one here that I could just simply put, and I would know that that represents one mole, 
right? How many moles of carbon do I have uh, in this one? Well, I have two moles of carbon. How many moles of hydrogen? Six moles of hydrogen. How many moles of oxygen? One mole of oxygen. If I look at this next one, and I want to know how many moles of carbon I have, two times two, I have four moles of carbon. How many moles of hydrogen do I have? Two times six, I have 12 moles of hydrogen. And this is how we're going to kind of keep track of the masses in our chemical reactions. So if I look here at this chemical reaction, uh, I have one mole of magnesium on my reactant side, and I have one mole of magnesium on my product side. I have one, two, three moles of oxygen on my reactant side. Here's one plus these two. So I have three moles of oxygen on my reactant side. And I have three moles on my product side. I have one mole of carbon on my reactant side. And I have one mole of carbon on my product side. So here we've observed the law of conservation of mass. Whatever mass that I started with on my reactant side is the same amount of mass that I have on my product side. But it's not always that way when we're looking at chemical reactions. Is that if we take a look at this one here, well, phosphorus on the reactant side, I have one. On my product side, I also have one. I have three moles of chlorine on my reactant side, but I only have one on my product side. Well, that's an issue. I, I, where did it go? Did it just disappear? Uh, I have one mole of hydrogen on my reactant side, one on my product side. I only have one mole of phosphorus on my reactant side, but all of a sudden, now I have three. Well. How did chlorine just disappear? How did fluorine just appear? Right? Is that we violate that law of conservation of mass. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to balance equations. I have two methods in order to balance equations. So I'll teach both methods. Pick one, whichever one you want to use, use it. Professor Kennedy might use a different uh, way. I, I don't know. Might find some way to do it on YouTube. I don't know, but again, there's there's different methods. I only teach two. Uh, I I can't spend you know teaching ten different methods on how to balance equations. So here, <clears throat> one way we're going to do this is we're just going to simply just kind of go. It's kind of a, a game of cat and mouse. We just kind of go back and forth, back and forth until we have everything equal to each other. So I'm just going to take an accounting of what I have here. Uh, so I'm going to write all of my elements, phosphorus, chlorine, hydrogen, and fluorine. And on the product side, I'm going to, I'm going to, I know that it can't disappear. So I'm just going to write it in the exact same order because I'm going to make two lists here. I'm going to put phosphorus, chlorine, hydrogen and fluorine and I'm just going to just kind of repeat exactly so that I have two identical lists here. And now I'm going to take track of how much I actually have. So on my reactant side I have one phosphorus, three chlorines, one hydrogen, one fluorine. And on the product side I have one phosphorus, one chlorine, one hydrogen, and three fluorine. Now the whole idea behind this is that I want these two lists to be identical. I want them to equal each other. Um, I don't have any specific uh, order. 
I just start from the top and I work my way to the bottom. I see that phosphorus one, phosphorus one, that those two already match. So now I'm going to go down to the next element. I notice that chlorine, I have three, but over here, I only have one. <laughs> We're going to make this change with what we call as a coefficient. So this is what we consider a coefficient. And when I put that coefficient in front of the molecule, this distributes out this way, which means that I now have three moles of chlorine. So I'm going to cross this out and I'm going to update that, that I have three. But when I do that, it also affects the hydrogen. So I need to update that, and I'm going to update that so that I have three. What you don't want to do, and what I have seen students do in the past, is they go, oh, well, let's see. Since I need three of them over there, I'm just going to put in a three. Well, you've completely changed the compound at this point. The product is HCl. The product is not HCl3. So we can't just randomly put subscripts in there, is that we fix this with what we call a coefficient. And then that coefficient, again, distributes to whatever is in front of it. So now I'm going to go back to the top of the list, and I see phosphorus looks good, chlorine, three and three, that matches, but my hydrogens don't match. So now I'm going to go to the reactant side, and I need a coefficient in front of here that's going to provide three hydrogens. So if I put a three in front of here, that means that I also have three hydrogens over here. But that three also affects fluorine. So I'm going to update that, and I'm going to put a three here. Now when I look at my list, phosphorus, one and one, we're good. Chlorine, three and three, we're good. Hydrogen, three and three, we're good. Fluorine, three and three, we're good. Is that I now have what we call a balanced chemical equation. So that is one method we use in order to, we're going to practice it on a few more here. Um, so let's see here. So let's balance this equation here. I'm going to write down my elements, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. And I'm going to make the identical list over here, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. I'm going to keep track of what I have here. So nitrogen, I need all of the nitrogen on the reactant side. There's two here. And there's two here, which means I have four nitrogens. Oxygen, I have four. Hydrogen, I also have four. On the product side, I have two nitrogens. I have one oxygen. And I have two hydrogens. So now it comes time to balance. This, this is the, our game, our cat, you know, game of, of cat and mouse that we're just going to go back and forth. So I start from the top, nitrogen. I see that I need more on my product side because I only have two and I need four. So I'm going to use coefficient. And if I put a two out front, well, that's going to give me four nitrogen. It doesn't affect anything else. So I'll, now I go and I say nitrogen four, nitrogen four, we're good. Oxygen four, oxygen one, well, I need more oxygen on my product side. So in order to get four oxygens, I'm going to need to put this number four out front. That's going to distribute here to the hydrogen. Let me write it on the other side. 
it's going to distribute to this, and it's also going to distribute to this. So let me update this before I move on. So I have four oxygens, but now I have eight hydrogens. So I go back to my list, nitrogen, four and four, oxygen, four and four, hydrogen, four and eight, which means that now I have to increase the hydrogen here. I'm gonna, if I put a two in front of it, well, let's see, it's gonna affect this and it's also gonna affect this. So hydrogen, I have eight, but let me update this because now two times two is four plus these two over here means that I have six nitrogen. So now I have to go back to the top here. My nitrogens are not balanced anymore. Well, I can fix that because luckily I work with something that I can erase and I can. I'm allowed to change this stuff. I, it's okay. And just because I put a two in front of it doesn't mean that it's stuck there forever. If I have to change that, well, let's see, what number could I put in front so that I get six nitrogens and I can put a three in front and now that gives me six nitrogens. And I go back, nitrogen, six and six, oxygen, four and four, hydrogen, eight and eight. Uh, then we come to something like this here. So here, right, let's try this one here. I'm going to put phosphorus, hydrogen, and then I have phosphorus, then I have hydrogen. All right, so let's go ahead and try and figure this one out. So phosphorus here, I have two, hydrogen, four, phosphorus, five, hydrogen, three. So if I have two on one side and five on the other, well, how do I get those to match? I mean, uh, there's no number. I, I can't put 2.5, right? Because we don't want any fractions. We need a, a whole number. So if I put three here, well, that only gives me six. Well, let's put a four here. Well, that's going to give me uh, eight. And, and we only need five here. So we're going to start looking at what we're going to consider some common denominators, right? Uh, least common multiple. What, what number can they both go into, right? So here, uh, I think I'll initially start with, uh, maybe I'll start with 10, right? Two and five can definitely both go into 10. So here, uh, let's put a five in front of this. Well, that gives me 10 phosphorus, and that gives me 20 hydrogens. Well, on the other side, <coughs> I have five phosphorus, and I need 10. Well, let's see. I could put a six in front of this. I could put a six in front of this. Uh, that would give me six phosphorus plus these four, and that gives me 10 phosphorus. But that also gives me 18 hydrogen. And 18 just isn't good enough. And it's at this point here. It, if I make a couple of attempts, I stop. I don't use this back and forth method to figure this out. Is that I use a method, uh, if you've taken algebra, it's called system of equations, uh, and I use that method instead. So here, we're going to go back to a couple of these. And I'll introduce this new method. And then after we've learned it, we're going to come back and figure this one out. So here, 
I know that I need coefficients. So I'm going to, I'm going to label these coefficients over here. I need coefficient A, B, C, and D, right? And I have to figure these out. So I'm going to write my elements as I normally would. Phosphorus, fluorine, hydrogen, and fluorine. But on the other side, I'm not going to make that identical list. On the other side, I'm going to write A, B, C, and D. All right, so now it comes time to find these equations. The equations are not difficult. Don't, don't get overwhelmed and, oh, I don't, I don't really get it, Alex, I understand it. No, it's not hard, okay? It's not hard to come up with the equations. If I look at phosphorus, how many moles of phosphorus do I see here? One. All right, that's not hard, the number one, because I only see one phosphorus. Now I'm going to look at the variable that's in front of it, A. So I write 1A. No phosphorus here. And I'm going to treat the reaction arrow like it's an equal sign. I see phosphorus here. And how many do I see? I see 1. And what's the variable in front of it? It's the letter C. And that's the process I use in order to come up with these equations. Chlorine, how many do I see? Three. What's the variable in front of it? A. No chlorine here. I see the reaction arrow, so I'm going to write an equal sign. No chlorine here but I do see it over here. How many are there? One. What's the letter in front? D. Hydrogens. I see one hydrogen. The letter in front is B. Equals. There's none, no hydrogen here, but there is hydrogen in the last. And how many hydrogens do we have here? One. What's the letter in front? D. Fluorine, one, B, equals three, C. You can't tell me that that's hard. That is not difficult in order to get these reactions, these equations. Now that I have these equations, this is the best part is that I'm going to now choose numbers to make these equations true. And you're allowed to pick any number in the world. Um, I could pick 5 million. I, I could say A is equal to 5,600,829. Why would I do that? That's ridiculous. I, I want an easy number here. If I want to solve this equation here, I want to do this math in my head. I don't want to pull a calculator out. I'm going to choose a number for A that's going to make this top equation true. If I force A to be the number 1, 1 times 1 is 1. And 1 is equal to 1C, so C must also be equal to 1. And I've just figured out two of these coefficients. So if A is equal to 1, that means C is equal to 1. And now I'm going to go to the next equation. If A is equal to 1, because that's what we decided already, if A is equal to 1, well, that means D must be equal to 3. <clears throat> we already know what, since we know what D is, because we figured that out, if D is equal to 1, then that means, I'm sorry, if D is equal to 3, that means that B must also be equal to 3. How did I figure that out? Well, let's, right? 1B is equal to 
D. If we know that D is three, one B is equal to one times three, one B is equal to three, B is equal to three. This is just very simple math, right? So here, now that I have my coefficients for A, B, C, and D, well, I can just put those in here. A is equal to one, B is equal to three, C is equal to one, D is equal to three. There's no guessing game here. Don't go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You just come up with your equations, solve them, put the numbers in. <clears throat> we'll do it here. Uh, let's write nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. A, B, C, D. A, B, C, D. Now my equations, two nitrogens in front of the letter A, 2A, two nitrogens in front of the letter B, plus 2B. Remember, we reaction arrow is the equal sign, so that equals 2C. Oxygen, 4A, equals 1D. Hydrogen, 4B, is equal to 2D. Well, I'm definitely not going to start with this one. This one's, this one's too difficult to start with. I'm going to start with something more simple. So I'm going to start with oxygen. I'm going to pick a number for oxygen. If I say that oxygen, A, if I say A is equal to the number one, that means that D is equal to the number four when I solve this. So now I know what A is, and I know what D is. If I know D, let's go to this one down here. If I know that D is equal to 4 because I just solved it, I'm going to have 4B equals 2 times 4. 4B is equal to 8. B is equal to 2. Well, now I know what A is, and I know what B is. A is equal to 1. B is equal to 2. So let's solve that real quick. Uh, I'm going to have 2 plus 4 is equal to 2C. 6 is equal to 2C. 3 is equal to C. So now I know all these variables. A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, D is 4. So I've balanced this equation. Well, now let's go back to the one we couldn't solve earlier. And we'll use this math method here. Phosphorus, hydrogen. A, B, C, A, B, C. Phosphorus is 2A, 2A, remember the reaction is equal, so equals 1B plus 4C. Hydrogen, 4A, equals 3B. Well, here, <coughs> I can't make A equal 1. If A equals 1, this is the mess that happens. 4 times 1 equals 3B. 4 equals 3B. 
four thirds equals B. We don't want that. So I'm not going to go that route. Uh, what I need to look for is I want to make sure I can solve this in my head, which means I'm going to leave the least common multiple here. If I choose A to be the number three, well, I can definitely solve that in my head. If A is equal to three, 12 is equal to 3B, which means that B is equal to 4. If A is equal to 3, B is equal to 4 because those both come out to 12, right? If A is equal to 3 and B is equal to 4, this is just simple math, 12 equals 12, right? So now I've already figured out two of these. Now I can go back to this first one over here. If I know A is equal to 3, and I know B is equal to 4. Well, let's go ahead and solve this down here. Uh, that's going to give me 6 is equal to 4 plus 4C. You can solve this. Subtract 4, right? Subtract 4, right? And I get 2 is equal to 4C. Divide by 4, divide by 4, and we get 1 half is equal to C. And then go, oh no, Alex, Alex, I got a fraction. <sighs> Tears start streaming down. No, fraction. What am I going to do? Don't panic. It's just math. It's very easy to get rid of the fraction. I'm not going to put a fraction. In, as my coefficient up here. It's very simple to get rid of this fraction. If I multiply this by 2, and I multiply this by 2, and I multiply this by 2, if I multiply all of it by 2, I get rid of the fractions. A is equal to 6, B is equal to 8, C is equal to simply just 1. 6, eight. You don't have to put the one in front of it, but if you choose, it's fine. Uh, so these are my two methods. Pick ever which one you want to do. Uh, to me, it doesn't matter, but it, it, I'm not going to spend an hour trying to figure this one out, going back and forth, erasing, back and forth, erasing, back and forth, erasing, when I could spend two minutes trying to figure out this math. Right. Uh, instead of an hour trying to figure out by erasing and going back and forth. But either method you use doesn't really matter to me. Uh, is how we balance these equations here. All right. <coughs> so now we're coming up on uh, some combination reactions here. Uh, well, not just combination reactions, but different types of reactions. Let me see what we're going to get into. And then before we take a... Yeah, let's cover this, and then we'll, we'll take a little small break after this. All right, so here we have what we consider. These are what we consider four different types of reactions. We're going to have what we call combination reactions, um, decomposition reactions, single replacement, double replacement reactions, if you've already seen. And this, this is a general model, right? It's not written in stone. It doesn't have to look exactly like this in order to be a combination reaction. But generally, we take some reactant, add another reactant, and then we get one product, which means that this could also be a combination reaction. I could put A plus B plus C and get A, B, C. And we'd still consider that a combination reaction. Um, we can go, yeah, you know, I think we'll probably just stop right there. Yeah, so uh, we can consider, so it, it's not written in stone that, that here I can put, maybe, uh, maybe I have B plus C plus A, and I get A, B, C. It's still a combination reaction. It doesn't really matter the order of the reactants, right? The order of the reactants really isn't what we're concerned with. It's just, just that we have different compounds and we put them all together to make one, right? And that's what we consider a combination reaction. 
then we have what we consider decomposition reactions. Right? And here again, we have some general formula where we have here is, and if you look at AB here, so here's AB, and then we break it up into two different compounds. We take the aluminum and separate it from the nitrogen. Uh, here, but you'll notice, look at the next one here. This is calcium carbonate. We're going to get calcium oxide plus some carbon dioxide but we take one compound and we split it up. We take one compound and we split it up. It doesn't mean that necessarily I have to, it, I don't have to separate this into calciums, then into carbons, and then into oxygens. What we wanna understand here for decomposition reaction is we're taking some compound and splitting it up into some simpler products. Uh, we could even go as far as, you know, what if I had A, B, C, and I split that up into A plus B plus C, we still consider that a decomposition reaction, right? I have one compound, and I'm splitting it up into some different compounds, some, some simpler products. Uh, <clears throat> then we have what we consider single replacement reactions. Single replacement reactions have to do uh, with cations and anions, where we're going to see um, the anion switch to, where it's going to take its place, going to switch with a, a different cation. And we see that here. So here, the chlorine is my anion. And now the chlorine and my product go, the chlorine is going to meet up with the zinc and the hydrogen is by itself. Here, the anion sulfate goes with what's alone, this single, this single element here, and we get iron phosphate, and now the copper is left by itself. So here, it's a, this is just, again, what we consider a general rule. It's not written in stone. Uh, we could put um, BC plus A, and we get AC plus B, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be A plus BC. We could put BC plus A, right? Uh, it's just kind of a general form here where we see the anion meet up with the other cation. So now we have iron, right, or oh, sorry, chromium nitrate, and then the lead is going to be by itself. Then we have what we're going to consider double replacement reactions. In your textbooks, this is what you have. You have AB plus CD, you get AD. Your textbooks state this. Uh, it's up to you if you want to change it. Uh, I think it creates confusion personally. So here, uh, I don't use BCCB, uh, and I'll explain uh, why I don't do that. Uh, if we look at the first problem here, let me rewrite this here. I'm going to have AgNO3 plus Ki. If the silver Ag, I'm going to represent, that's going to represent A. The nitrate is going to represent B. The potassium is going to represent C. And the iodine, we're going to, we're going to represent I by the letter D. And if we put this together, it's telling us to put A and D together. A and D. And we get silver iodide, just like we see right here. And your textbooks, your textbooks say to do this. I'm going to cross this out for a minute. Your textbooks say to put B and C together. B and C. But look what they have. So that's why I would like you to change it to CB. 
because if I take C and put it together with B, I get this here, right? So uh, just a small change that I'd like you to put in your book. But this is what we'd consider double replacement reactions, where we have the anion go with this cation, and this anion is going to go with this cation. <clears throat> and we see that throughout uh, each of these examples here. The anion goes with this cation, and this anion goes with this cation. And we have a, a we consider a double replacement reaction. So, double replacement reactions. Double replacement reactions are commonly found in what we consider precipitation reactions. Right? Uh, some precipitation reaction requires us to have a couple of aqueous solutions that are their solutions. Right? They're not solids, uh, they're aqueous solutions. So if I take an aqueous solution of silver nitrate and I mix it with an aqueous solution of sodium chloride, this is aqueous, this is aqueous, I'm going to get silver chloride to precipitate out. That this silver chloride is going to be solid, right? It's an insoluble product that we call a precipitate, and we get it silver chloride to precipitate out <clears throat> and remain in the solution of sodium nitrate, right? But how are you going to know how to find the solid, right? That's what we need to learn here. So here, you have a table. This table is going to help you determine what your precipitate is going to be if you have one, right? <clears throat> we look at the anion, right? We're always if, – if I take a look here, silver chloride. How did I know that silver chloride was going to be my solid? Well, I'm going to take a look at this. I'm going to use the table, and I'm going to find the anion of chloride. And here it says chlorides. And if I follow this, soluble compounds means that they're aqueous. Soluble means that it can be dissolved. Insoluble means that you're going to have a solid. So all chlorides are aqueous. They're soluble. All chlorides are aqueous unless it meets the exception and we find it with – those are one of the exceptions – silver. If we find chloride with silver, it will have a precipitate which is solid. So that's how I know that silver chloride is insoluble. It's insoluble because it's a precipitate because it meets silver as the exception to this chloride. So let's look at some other examples here. Potassium sulfate. Well, I'm going to look for sulfates. And Unless you've memorized these, you're you're going to be lost. You're going to be flipping back and forth in your book. Um, if you if you haven't memorized this, this is it's going to be meaningless to you, right? It doesn't doesn't matter um, what I say. You're you, you know um, you can't find it on the list if you don't know that that's sulfate. So here, I'm going to look at my sulfates, and I located them, and now I'm going to I'm going to go across. And I see that I have some exceptions. All soluble compounds are aqueous. So potassium sulfate. The exceptions are going to be solids. This is not potassium sulfate, not potassium sulfate, not potassium sulfate. Uh, 
So it doesn't meet one of the exceptions, which means that potassium sulfate is aqueous. Magnesium nitrate, let's go to the next one. Magnesium nitrate. Well, let me find my nitrates. My nitrates are right here. And I'm gonna go across and I don't see any exception to that rule. That all nitrates are aqueous. And there's no exception to that rule. When we look at these rules down here, these rules are for chlorides. These exceptions are for sulfates. And here, there is no exception for nitrates, for acetates. So here, this is going to be aqueous. Acetate, you have to recognize that's acetate. Well, here's my acetates. Any exceptions to that rule? Nope, no exceptions to that rule. This is gonna be aqueous. Calcium sulfate, well, let's go back to sulfates. Oh, there is an exception for calcium sulfate. Because I meet that exception, calcium sulfate is a solid. Silver phosphate, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna find my phosphates. Here's my phosphates. And here are the exceptions to that rule. But when we look at these, this table here, this says insoluble which means if it's insoluble, it's a solid. And my exception will not have a precipitate. So these are gonna be aqueous. So silver phosphate, all phosphates are solid, unless it's with sodium, potassium, or ammonium. Well, it's with silver, so it doesn't meet one of the exceptions. Silver phosphate is a solid. Barium hydroxide, I go to my hydroxides. Oh, there's my exception, barium hydroxide. It's going to be not have a precipitate and it's going to be aqueous. Uh, silver chloride, we've already done, here's chloride, here's silver. So that ends up being a solid, but this is how you use that table. And again, if you don't know your polyatomic sulfate, nitrate, acetate, uh, this table is, is meaningless uh, to you. <clears throat> All right, so let's go ahead and take a break here. There's still uh, a lot we have to get through, but let's go ahead and uh, take a small break for about, uh, let's say 10 minutes at least. So we'll come back at uh, 9.52. Uh, when we're talking about double replacement reactions, we're talking about um, precipitation reactions. So there's a process, a, a, a lengthy process in order to get a uh, chemical formula. So you guys are, are responsible for learning how to write your own chemical formulas. That if you're given two reactants, um, can you give us the product, right? Um, can you tell us which product is going to be the precipitate? And again, very lengthy process in order to get this done. So <clears throat> in order to get this done, there, there's, there's four major steps. So don't try and combine steps one through four, steps one through five into one single step. All right. What we need to do is we need to take um, small steps in order to get the uh, reaction done. So I'm going to walk you through this a little bit, and then we're going to actually do one with, with only just using the given reactants. So Step one, in order to come up with your own chemical reaction. So initially, we're given just some magnesium chloride, and we're given some sodium hydroxide. And how we put that together is, again, by this process here. So step one, in order to put this reaction together, is your products are going to A, 
be A, D, C, B, right? And those are represented here. So I have each one of the variables represented A, B, C, and D, where we put A and D together, and we get magnesium hydroxide. You see that here, magnesium hydroxide. And then we put CB together. C, sodium, and B, the chloride. And some of you are already like, oh, hey, Alex, Alex, maybe it's a typo. You didn't, there's two chlorides there. Yeah, I know. I absolutely know that there's two chlorides there. I did not forget about them, but we're only on step one. Step one is this. Step one is not balancing. Step one is not making the products neutral and balancing the charges. We're not balancing coefficients here. We're not. Step one is simply just put A and D together, put C and B together. It's <laughs> it's unbelievably difficult for students to not bring this over, but trust me. Trust me, you don't need to do it. If you do this, resist, resist any temptation you have to do that. You will mess things up. I know that there's two chlorides over there, but at this point, that's not my concern. My concern is simply just the first step, step one being AD plus CB. And that's going to be my step one. So, so do everything you can not to bring that over. Don't carry over the number of moles that you see in the reactants. All right. So our next step is going to be balancing the charge. Not balancing the equation, but make sure that your products are neutral. You guys... Excuse me, you guys had practice on lab two doing this, that uh, if I have calcium, which is two plus, and I have fluoride, which is one minus, well, how do I put those together? Well, I need, I need two fluorides. I'm going to have calcium fluoride, and I put those together, and these are now neutral. Right, this is two plus, this is one minus, but I have two of them. So you guys had plenty of practice doing that. So when we're looking at these products here, step two is to make sure that they're neutral. Magnesium is two plus. Chlorine is one minus. Sodium is one plus, hydroxide is one minus. Magnesium's two plus. If hydroxide is one minus, well, that's not neutral. I'm going to need to fix that. I need two of those. Now it's neutral. Sodium is one plus. Chlorine is one minus. Well, that's already neutral. I don't have to do anything. But for those students that can't resist this, this is what this is why I don't bring that mole over. If I do this, students go, oh, well, now I have to balance charges. Well, you know what? I'll just add another sodium here. That fixes it. No, you made it even worse, right? So this is my why I just say don't don't bring those over. It's not necessary. So we should have something that looks like this now, right? So we subscripts to make these products neutral. We use a subscript in order to do that. All right, so step one is simply just A, D, plus C, B. And step two is to just verify that your products are neutral, that those charges balance out. Step three is, well, now I have to balance the equation. So step three says balance the equation. Um, these are going to be some of the simplest ones that you do. You, you don't have to make a list. So if, as far as precipitation reactions, double replacement reactions, we don't want to overcomplicate things. 
There's no need for a list. There's no need to make equations. I'm simply just going to go back and forth until this is balanced. One magnesium, one magnesium. Two chlorines, one chlorine. So let me put a two in front of here. That means two sodiums. I only have one. Let me put a two in front of here. Two hydroxides, two hydroxides. All right. So as far as the double replacement reaction goes, again, there's no need to make a list for anything. We don't want to overcomplicate it. We just kind of go back and forth until everything's balanced. So we end up with uh, our balanced chemical equation here. Now comes time to find the product. Which product is going to be solid? This is where you use this table here. I have magnesium hydroxide and I have sodium chloride. Only one of them is going to be solid, not both. Here's my hydroxides. They're all solid unless it's with sodium, potassium, calcium, or barium. Well, it's with magnesium. I just found my solid. The other one will be aqueous. So here, solid, aqueous. And we now have what we consider the balanced chemical equation. Now, this balanced chemical equation, uh, if we take a look at, here's a beaker. Okay? And this beaker is, uh, let me put some water in it. So now there's some, filled it up with water. What happens in the solution? When, when, we, when we take this and we put that into the beaker and we take sodium hydroxide and we put it in the beaker, that is not what it looks like in the solution. In the solution, we have magnesium. Because it's aqueous, it's not a solution. Because it's aqueous, it means it's been dissolved. It's been dissolved, and that means that I have ions of magnesium, and I have ions of chlorine floating around the entire solution. When I put sodium hydroxide in there that's aqueous, I have ions of sodium and ions of hydroxide. So this is what happens. So because they're aqueous, they're dissolved in the solution. And this the, the magnesium ions and the hydroxide ions meet up together, and they form a solid that sits here at the bottom, right? So this is a kind of a visual representation of what's going on in this chemical reaction. And this process here that I've just shown you, this process, we have to be able to represent that in a formula. Is that what's the actual reaction? What actually took place in order to make the magnesium hydroxide? Well, the sodium didn't have anything to do with it. The chlorine didn't have anything to do with it. So what was the actual reaction that took place? And that's what we're going to learn how to do next. So in order to do this, uh, we, we're going we're gonna to split all of these up into ions. And we come up with this huge formula here. So let me kind of walk you through what we did here. This is what we're going to call the complete ionic equation uh, in your lab books. They call it the total ionic equation. Uh, so this is kind of something what we're looking for in lab four. Where anything that's aqueous, if it's aqueous, it means that it is just swimming around by itself in the solution because it's aqueous. 
So what we do here is we take this substance and we break it up into ions. And we're going to break this up into ions. We put the charge. It's Mg2+, plus, it's aqueous. And we, we switch this. I know that this is a subscript here, but this represents two moles of chlorine ions, chloride ions. And we put that subscript and turn it into this coefficient. What we don't want you to do, is we, this is not the same thing. This is not equal to this. This over here represents, I have one chloride ion and I have another chloride ion. That represents two chloride ions. This represents that I have a molecule of chlorine that has a one minus charge. But that's not what we have in the solution. In the solution, we have this. So we have to represent that this way. So this coefficient turns, I'm sorry, this subscript turns into a coefficient. And we'll continue. Because this is aqueous, I'm going to split it up. I have two sodium ions, two hydroxide ions. Because remember, this distributes this way. And the solid. Well, I'm not going to break that up because it's not an it's not an ion in the solution. Is the magnesium hydroxide is sitting here at the bottom as a solid, so I just leave it alone in my reaction that I write my total ionic equation as a solid because it, it's not an ion anymore. Two moles of sodium, but again that distributes, so I have two moles of chloride ions. And this is what we're going to consider. The, all of this down here is what we consider the total ionic equation. For the next portion, uh, we just need a simple math concept. Uh, if I put this, if I put S plus R plus T equals S plus R plus P, well, how do I clean this up? Well, it's easy. Uh, I can just simply cancel out the S's because they're the same, cancel out the R's that are the same, and I'm left with T equals P. Well, we're going to apply that concept to this chemical equation. We're going to treat the reaction arrow as if it was an equal sign. If I have something that's on each side of that reaction arrow that's identical, exactly the same. We can cross it out. Do I have two magnesium ions? No, I have magnesium, but I don't have magnesium 2 plus. Chloride, well, I don't need that because that's over here, that's over here. Here, this cancels out, this cancels out. And here's a cleaned up version of what we're looking at here, right? If it's on the same side, or if it's identical on both sides of the reaction here, we don't need it. And everything else, oops, everything else is written, whatever we didn't cancel out, we write as our net ionic equation. And this is the reaction that actually took place. This reaction here is what made this solid form. And that's the actual, what we call our net ionic equation. So let's practice with one here. We're going to go through all the steps here. So write the formula equation, the total ionic equation, the net ionic equation for magnesium chloride and sodium carbonate. All right, so we're going to start with this. We're going to start with magnesium chloride plus some sodium carbonate. Well, step one says this. Step one says we're going to go A, B plus C, D 
it's going to go to A, D, plus C, B. So if this is A, chloride is B, sodium is C, carbonate is D. Well, step one says to put A and D together. A, magnesium, and D, carbonate. Okay. Then it says put C and B together. C, which is sodium, and B, which is chloride. Do I worry about bringing this over? No, I absolutely don't worry about bringing that over. Um, you know what? I think we should probably let's. I think I'm going to stop here. I'm not going to. I'm not even gonna. I don't think I'm gonna finish this one. I think what I want to do is I want to do one from your your lab. So let me actually pull one up from your lab. Let's um, we're gonna let's let's finish the chemical equation here, but we're not gonna do the the total ionic and the uh, net ionic here. Um, is that I'd like to actually do one from your lab book instead. So let's just gonna let's just finish up here with this one real quick. But we won't we won't do the total ionic and net ionic on this one, just the formula equation. All right. So step one is done here. Step one. Step two is let's verify and make sure that our products are neutral, and we need to check the charges on that. So magnesium is in group two plus two. Chlorine's a halogen, group seven, so it's one minus. Sodium is group one, it's one plus, and carbonate. Oh, I don't think I wrote. Let me, that should be Na2CO3. And carbonate is going to be two minus. So magnesium is two plus, carbonate's two minus, one plus, one minus. Well, looks like magnesium and carbonate are neutral. Uh, looks like sodium and chloride are neutral. So now that I've made those neutral, now we're going to balance. So uh, are they neutral? Uh, three, is it balanced? Well, let's see. I have... One magnesium, one magnesium. Okay, we're good. Two chlorines, one chlorine. Let me put a two in front of it. That gives me two sodium, two sodium. We're good. One carbonate, one carbonate, and I have a balanced chemical equation. And the last thing I need to do is to decide which one of these products is my uh, solid. Magnesium carbonate, sodium chloride. Magnesium carbonate. Here's my carbonates. My carbonates are solid, uh, and it's magnesium carbonate. So sodium, potassium, ammonium doesn't meet the exception. The magnesium carbonate is my solid, which means this is aqueous. And I already know that these are aqueous in a double replacement reaction here. <coughs> All right. So let me get to uh, kind of a blank page here. Let me find a blank page. This is kind of blank, so we're going to work with this one here. All right, so from the lab, let's look at lab four. Um, uh, how about I'm looking at page 4-3 in the fourth well. So the fourth well says that we're going to mix three drops of iron. Oh, come on. We're going to mix three drops of iron nitrate. So here's iron nitrate. And I'm going to add three drops of potassium hydroxide. All right. So here, because I, it says that I'm adding drops of this, I know that it's not solid. I know that this is aqueous, and I know that this is aqueous. So step one, step one 
says to go A, B plus C, D, and you get A, D plus C, B. So let's write this in here. So this is A, B, D, and hydroxide is D. A and D together, iron, hydroxide. And then it says put C and B together, potassium, nitrate. I did bring one of these values over, and it's really important that we notice this. Um, I didn't bring these three over. Do not, do not do that. Do not. But you'll notice that I did bring, I did bring this three over. The reason I can bring that three over is because this is a polyatomic. If I do not bring that three over, I do not have nitrate. B, B is nitrate, NO3. But as far as how many of them I have, not necessary. I do not need to bring that three over. All right, so I've done A, D plus C, B. Here are the products neutral. Well, let's check. Um, nitrate is one minus. There's three of them, so that's three minus, which means that iron is three plus. Um, hydroxide is one minus. Potassium's in group one, it's one plus. If iron is three plus over there, iron is three plus over here. Hydroxide's one minus, potassium's one plus, nitrate's one minus. It looks like in the iron and the hydroxide are not neutral. So what I need to do is I need to add more hydroxide. I'm gonna add a total of three of them so that that's neutral. Potassium nitrate, this seems to be neutral, plus one, minus one. So it looks like these are neutral. Now, the balance. Is the equation balanced? Well, let's take a look. One iron, one iron. Three hydroxides, one hydroxide. So I'm gonna put a three in front of this. But that means I have three potassium and I only have one over here. So I'll put a three in front of that. I have three nitrates. I have three nitrates and I've balanced this equation. Now, which one of these is solid? Iron hydroxide, potassium nitrate. And if we take a look at that table, we end up finding that the solid is the iron hydroxide, iron three hydroxide. All right. So this is our balanced formula equation. Now we're going to do the net ionic equation. We're going to break anything that's aqueous, anything that's labeled aqueous, we're going to break up into ions. So here we'll begin with iron. It's aqueous. So iron is three plus. And I also put that it's aqueous. So that's my first ion. How many nitrate ions do I have? Well, I have three iron nitrate atoms, so three nitrates, charge of it, that it's aqueous. Three potassium ions, they're also aqueous, but I have also three hydroxide ions, are aqueous. A solid, I do not break up. I'm gonna leave it as it is. Next one is aqueous. I'm going to break that up into potassium plus three nitrates. I need to put that they're aqueous. And now I have the total 
ionic equation. And the next part is the net ionic equation. So this is where I'm going to start crossing out. Uh, this is on both sides. I don't need that. This is on both sides. I don't need that. And now whatever I didn't cross out, I'm just going to rewrite down here. So I have Fe 3 plus aqueous plus 3 hydroxides aqueous iron hydroxide solid. Is it hard? Yeah. Is it a lot of work? Yeah. You're in Chem 100. I didn't make you guys take Chem 100. You guys decided to take Chem 100. You need to know how to do this. Does it take a lot of work and a lot of practice? Yes, it absolutely does take a lot of work and a lot of practice to do this correctly. Right? Um, it, it's difficult. Yep, it absolutely is. I and I and I get it. I understand that it is, but it does take a lot of work, uh, a lot of practice to make sure that you're doing this correctly. All right. So. Uh, moving on to different type of reaction now, what we're going to call redox reactions. So <coughs> redox reactions uh, involve transferring electrons around. Right? Uh, is that when we put these reactants together, we're going to shift around some electrons. And in a non-redox non -redox reaction, there is no electron transfer between the substances. Okay, so where we get redox is we get them because we have some reactant that ox is oxidizing and we have another one that's reducing, right? So oxidation is a loss of electrons, reduction is a gaining of electrons. And that seems kind of counterintuitive to say that if it's, if it's reducing, if it's reduction occurring, that it's gaining electrons. It's gaining electrons. So if it's becoming, if it's gaining electrons, so let's let's say uh, we have nitrogen here. So let's look at reduction first. <clears throat> so reduction is a gaining of electrons uh, here. We'll say that new. Uh, let's say we'll say that nitrogen has uh, let's say seven protons and seven electrons. If nitrogen gains, so here it's neutral. If nitrogen gains a couple of electrons, say that iron or nitrogen now has nine electrons and only, I'm sorry, not protons, it has seven protons, but it gained nine electrons. Well, here it is. And we can see that reduction, if we, if we look at these numbers here, if we actually look at them at, as values, zero to negative two, is that the number got smaller. Negative two is definitely less than zero, right? So it's it's pretty it's pretty easy, I think, to always identify what's being reduced, what when reduction is occurring. So then if we go to the opposite end here, so let's say that we lost electrons. Let's say we lost two electrons and we have five electrons, which means that here now this is going to be plus two. And this is oxidation, while the other end is reduction. So whenever I'm looking at these species, I, I always try and identify, I always try and identify reduction first, always, because it's it's the easiest. If I'm looking at numbers, zero to two plus, that number got better, bigger. I, I absolutely know that didn't get reduced. Reduced, this this value is getting smaller here. So if we go from uh, iron three plus to iron two plus. Well, was this oxidized or reduced? Well, we go from three to two, that number got smaller, is that this was reduced. If I say I have iron two 
two plus to iron zero. Well, did that number get smaller? Yeah, it sure did, is that this was reduced. So <clears throat> as far as oxidation numbers go, uh, in, your, in your textbooks, uh, if you have your textbook and you look on page, oh, uh, where is it? 4-14. 4-14 says oxidation number. Uh, we're talking about electron bookkeeping, right? Um, you you can use those rules absolutely, or I've just kind of cleaned them up a little bit to make them a little bit easier to understand. If you want to write my rules down, uh, you can use my rules, and they, they work the same as those rules 1 through 4 here, right? So if you're looking at step one here on page 4-14 and you're looking at the electron bookkeeping and the rules there, I, I've just kind of cleaned those up. So rule one is basically saying hydrogen is always going to have an oxidation number of plus one. Oxygen is always going to be minus two. Right? Uh, it can't get any simpler than that, right? So that's rule number one for oxidation numbers. When we're when we're looking at oxidation numbers, you're gonna feel as if they're charges. They are not the charges. Rules for oxidation numbers. How we get an oxidation number are by these rules here. Don't try and go to the periodic table because you're not going to get the oxidation number there. You don't get the oxidation number from the periodic table. You get oxidation numbers which look like charges, but they are not from these rules here. Okay, along with, I've put, I put rule number one on 4-14, I've separated that into two different rules. So in your book, they combine both of these into one rule. I separated them for you. Uh, so the first half, of rule number one, the oxidation number of hydrogen is usually plus one, the oxidation number of oxygen is usually minus two. That's what I have here. Hydrogen's one plus, oxygen's one are minus two. Pure elements are elements that are by themselves. Elements that are by themselves have an oxidation number of simply just zero. This is what we call their elemental state. So if I simply just have iron here, this is in its elemental state because it's by itself, which means that my oxidation number here is simply just a zero. And this will go for any element that's by itself. Calcium by itself, elemental state, zero. All of your diatomics, I didn't list all the diatomics here, but all of your diatomics are also in their elemental state, which means that they're also zero. So if I put bromine, what's the oxidation number here? Well, it's a diatomic, so it's simply just zero. All right, <clears throat> rule number two in your book says in binary ionic compounds, the oxidation number is predicted, blah, blah, blah. Uh, don't, uh, this is specifically talking about three groups on the periodic table. It's talking about group one metals, group two metals, and group seven, which are your halogens. So anything in group one will have an oxidation number of plus one. Any metal in group two, oxidation number of plus two, and any of your halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, are going to have minus one oxidation number. So if I write this, and I want to know the oxidation numbers, I don't go to the periodic table. I use my rules. Rule one says hydrogen is plus one. The next rule here. Rule number, my rule number three is that halogens, which are in group seven, include chlorine. This is one minus. You have to know group one, group two, group seven. 
right? Uh, I can put this here, right? H2O. Rule number one says hydrogen is always plus one. Oxygen is always minus two. Don't be confused about this. This says H2 is zero, but this is by itself. This H2 is not by itself. That's not a diatomic, right? Water looks like this. H2 looks like this, right? Diatomic water. Let's see, right? If I do calcium uh, and fluorine, if I want to know the oxidation numbers, calcium's in group two, plus two. Fluorine is a halogen, minus one. And those are my oxidation numbers. Uh, <clears throat> Rule number three on your books, 4-14, talk about binary compounds, more metallic element. Um, don't worry about that. What it's talking about is it's talking about these monatomic ions. Whatever the charge, if, if I have uh, in a reaction, if I see this, here's Ag1+. plus. That charge is equal to the oxidation number. So I write Ag plus one. If I see zinc by itself, it's zero. If I see zinc with a charge, that oxidation number is equal to the charge plus two. Now, the oxidation numbers in a neutral compound have to equal zero. If we go back to water, this is a neutral compound. I have two hydrogens, each plus one, oxygen, which is minus two. And if I add those up, the sum of those oxidation numbers are zero. So let's try and figure some of this out with some of the rules that we have here. So here, the first one we have is dinitrogen tetrahydride. Right? So we're going to use the rules here. According to the rules that we've just gone over, there is no rule for nitrogen. Rule one doesn't involve nitrogen. Rule two, nope. Rule three, nope. Rule four, no. So nitrogen is not determined by those rules, but we can figure it out because hydrogen is always plus one. If hydrogen is plus one, there's four hydrogens there. There's four hydrogens there, which means that my total oxidation for hydrogen is plus four. If the oxidation numbers in a neutral compound have to equal zero, <clears throat> they have to equal zero. Whatever nitrogen is, whatever nitrogen is has to equal zero. Well, it's got to be minus four because there's two of them. Each one of them is minus two. So the oxidation number of nitrogen here is minus two. Go to the next one, oxygen. Well, the rule for oxygen is that it's minus two. If they have to equal up to zero and there's only one nitrogen, that has to be positive two. So we've just seen nitrogen now have different oxidation numbers. Again, these are not charges. I know the charge on nitrogen would be three minus. I go to the periodic table, it's in group five, and I determined that the charge is three minus, but we're not talking about charges. We're talking about oxidation numbers, right? So nitrogen can have a different number of oxidation numbers depending on the compound. If we go here, well, we can apply pure elements 
including our diatomics, have an oxidation number of simply just zero. I'm going to skip the next two. Let's do this one here. Uh, here, hydrogen is plus one. There's three of them, so that's going to be three plus. So in order for this to equal zero, nitrogen has to be three minus. So here, nitrogen is minus two, it's plus two, it's zero, it's minus three. And now we're going to cover these two here. These two take a little bit of extra work. Um, 4-14 of your textbook, rule number four. I'll read it. It says the sum of the oxidation number of all atoms in a compound is zero. For a polyatomic ion, the sum is equal to the charge on the ion. So this is a polyatomic. So what, whatever the oxidation number is for nitrogen plus whatever the oxidation number is for oxygen has to equal the charge of the polyatomic. Well, according to rule number one here, oxygen is always minus two. I know that there's three of them, so that's going to be minus six. What, because there's only one nitrogen, what plus a minus six will give you negative one? Positive five. So the oxidation number for oxygen here is plus five. NO2 minus whatever nitrogen is plus whatever oxygen is, has to equal negative one. Oxygen's minus two, that's gonna give me minus four, which means that nitrogen is going to be plus three. <clears throat> so now let's apply this to a chemical reaction. All right, let's apply this to a chemical reaction. I'm gonna cover some of this up here. Uh, let's see up here. All right, so let's apply. Let's look at the first reactant. Uh, there's no rule for carbon, but there is one for hydrogen. Hydrogen is plus one. There's four hydrogens, which is plus four, which means that carbon has to be minus four. The next one, 2O2, well, that's a diatomic. Diatomics are zero. Carbon dioxide, oxygen is minus two. There's two of them, that's gonna be minus four, which means carbon here is plus four. Water, oxygen's minus two. Hydrogen's always gonna be plus one. And now we're gonna notice some changes here. I notice that carbon goes from minus four to carbon plus four. Carbon goes from minus four to plus four. Oxygen goes from zero to minus two, from zero to minus two. Zero to minus two means that this oxygen was reduced and that carbon was oxidized. Uh, let's see if we have one more here. Uh, no, it doesn't look like we have another one uh, to practice with. <coughs> All right, uh, but you either use my rules here, uh, take a picture of it, it uh, doesn't matter. You, you can use my rules here, or you can use the rules on 4-14, but these are the rules in order to get an ought to get your oxidation numbers. Don't go to the periodic table and start looking at charges thinking that those are oxidation numbers because they're not, okay? We use these rules here in order to determine all of those oxidation numbers. 
a couple more. So we've talked about combustion, single replacement, double replacement. A couple more reactions that we have uh, are what we consider um, exothermic and endothermic reactions. Okay. So, <coughs> excuse me. So sometimes some of these reactions will actually uh, give off some some heat as a as a product. So we see heat, right? We talk about kcal's. We talk about joules, calories, kcal's. All those are units of heat. Is that we see some of these reactions will have heat as a product, right? Is that they're they're losing these reactants are losing energy. And they're releasing that energy as a product, and those are what we consider exothermic reactions, right? And they're not difficult to identify. You just simply, where's my energy? Is my energy in the product? Then that must be an exothermic reaction. Uh, here, right? Notice here's my reaction arrow, and notice the location of my energy now is that this has to absorb energy. In order for this, this reaction to take place, this reaction will absorb energy to make the products. So this is what we consider an endothermic reaction. Right? But look at the, again, we're gonna look at the placement of that energy. Here's my reaction arrow, energy as a product, exothermic. energy as a reactant, endothermic, right? Uh, where we talk about uh, endothermic reactions are absorbing energy and exothermic reactions are losing energy. And we've already talked about the, the single and the uh, reversible reactions that uh, now we'll get into something we call uh, stoic geometry. So everything we've been doing has kind of been building up to this point. Um, early in the in the lecture, early in the lecture, we talked about um, <clears throat> some conversions, right? Is that you have a tool, you have a pathway in order to convert something from grams into moles and you also have a pathway to convert something from moles into grams. Additionally, what we're going to be doing now, because now we understand equations and now we understand balanced equations, is that we need to have a pathway in order to convert moles of one substance into moles of a completely different substance. So in order to understand that, uh, we're going to use these chemical equations here. So what we need to find is we're going to try and understand something we call um, the uh, a molar ratio. There is only one location to get the molar ratio. And we get this molar ratio from the balanced chemical equation. And that is the only place you're going to find that molar ratio is from the balanced chemical equation. So if I'm looking at this equation, and it's already balanced. Right? On the exam, I'm not going to make you balance it and do the calculations. On the exam, we'll, we'll give you the equation is already going to be balanced. Uh, what my molar ratio is, is if I look at iron, uh, this would be iron three oxide. So if I'm looking at iron three oxide here, I can say for every, I see that there's only one mole. So if I have one mole of iron three oxide, in the formula, I have three moles of carbon monoxide. 
or I could use a reciprocal value. I could say I have three moles carbon monoxide for every one mole of iron oxide. And this is what we consider a molar ratio. And I can do this with any compound in the reaction. It doesn't matter if it's a reactant or a product. It does not matter. Is that I can write, let me write another one here. How about I put for every three moles carbon monoxide, I have two moles of iron. And I can do the reciprocal value. For every two moles of iron, I have three moles carbon monoxide. So it doesn't matter if it's reactant, 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 product, product, reactant. We can do product and product. I can say uh, for every three I can say for every three moles of carbon dioxide, I have two moles of iron. For every three moles carbon dioxide, I have three moles carbon monoxide. So it doesn't matter how I put these together, right? I could put product and product, product and reactant, reactant and product, doesn't really matter. Uh, reciprocal values, I can flip it around however I need to. But this is your only pathway that's going to allow you to convert from moles of one thing, moles of one compound, and convert it into moles of a different compound. And again, the only location you're going to get this from, you don't get this from the periodic table, you get it from the balanced chemical equation. So here, let's take a look at the first problem here. Calculate how many moles of iron. So moles of iron are produced from 1.80 moles of carbon monoxide. Well, I have moles of carbon monoxide here. All right, so uh, I have to convert this into moles of something else. So I have, and again, we just went over this. This mole ratio, the mole ratio from the balanced chemical equation is how you convert from moles of one substance into moles of a different substance. If I want to know how many moles of iron I have, I have to get rid of moles of carbon monoxide, which means that I'm going to need a molar ratio in order to do that. Where did I get this mole ratio from? Two moles of iron for every three moles of carbon monoxide. I get it from the chemical equation. If I set this up right, I need to get rid of moles of carbon monoxide. And how many moles do I have? For every three moles carbon monoxide, I have two moles of iron. And I can get rid of those units. And that mole ratio has now allowed me, has allowed you, to convert from moles of one substance to moles of a completely different substance. Point two zero uh, of iron. And again, just as a reminder, where did I get where did I get this information from? Right here. Where did I get this information from? Right here. It comes from that formula, chemical formula. All right, uh, let's look at another one here. <clears throat> Calculate how many moles of iron oxide 
from 66 grams of CO2. When we're doing these calculations, uh, this is going to introduce now something that we learned very early on in the lecture. Recall, when we, when we do this, as chemists, we always work in moles. If we're given something in grams, we convert it to moles, always. Moles is how we do our calculations. Moles is how we work with chemical formulas. So if you're given something in grams, do yourself a favor, go to the periodic table and convert it into uh, moles, right? Get the molar mass is what we need here. So here we're going to start off with 66.0 grams of CO2. But I need to go to the periodic table. The periodic table says that, let's see, carbon is 12.01, and there's only one of those, and oxygen is 16.00, and there's two of those. 32, 12, whoop. .01. But I can't just 40 foot, put 40.01. This is what I'm going to write out. Remember how we did this. 44.01 grams of CO2 for every mole of CO2. And now I'm going to take an extra five seconds here. And I'm going to write the reciprocal value of this. Mole of CO2, 44.01 gram CO2. Because this is going to help me take that extra five seconds, write both of them out. Only one of them is going to work in this equation. If I have to get rid of grams of CO2, well, I'm glad I took that extra five seconds because this is the conversion factor that's going to do it. Mole of CO2, 44.01 grams of CO2. And these units now cancel out. The question's asking us, though, is how many moles of iron oxide? And I have moles of CO2. This is where we need, when we're asked, when you, when you don't have the right moles, and we need to convert from moles of one substance to moles of a different substance, this is where this mole ratio is used. So according to this, I have to get rid of moles of CO2. I'm just going to write that right here. I'm just going to write moles of CO2 because I have to get rid of it. I need it in the denominator. Well, according to the chemical formula, how many moles of CO2 do we have? Three. I need to get moles of We need to get moles of iron three oxide, and according to the formula, there's only one mole there. These units now cancel out. So as long as those cancel out there, uh, we've answered the question. There's, I, I don't have to do anything else, and, and we'll round this, and I think it comes out to 0.500. have our answer here, right? But again, where does this come from? It comes from the chemical equation, that mole ratio. All right. Let's do one more here. So we can have 7.52, so 7.52 grams of carbon monoxide. That's 12.01 plus 16.00. 28.01. Um, this is carbon. This is oxygen. So I have 28.01 grams of carbon monoxide for every mole of carbon monoxide. Or I'm going to take a quick five seconds here and I'll put for every mole of carbon monoxide, I have 20.01 grams of carbon monoxide. 
again, I'm pretty glad that I wrote, took that extra five seconds because I can see which one that I need here. One mole carbon monoxide for every 28.01 grams of carbon monoxide. And now I can easily cancel those units out. But it's asking about iron here. All I have is information for carbon monoxide. So I have to convert this. Uh, I go convert this from uh, carbon Sorry about that. So let me convert that there. So I have to go from moles of carbon monoxide to moles of iron. Well, where do I get that from? I get that from the chemical equation. Moles of carbon monoxide, moles of iron. I have three moles carbon monoxide, because I have to get rid of that. And I get two moles of iron, so I can now cancel those units out. But I'm not done because it's asking for grams. But again, a couple hours ago, we knew how to we know how to deal with this. We converted from grams to moles, moles to grams. Well, let's convert moles to grams. The periodic table says that iron is 50. Who was it? 55.85. Let's take a look. Iron is 55.85, yes. So iron is 55.85 grams, grams of iron, I'll put iron, let me put like this, grams of iron over moles of iron. <clears throat> so here, I don't have to use the reciprocal value. simply cancel these units out and I've canceled everything out except for my grams and this ends up being 10.0 grams up okay. but again as a reminder where did I where did I get this information from I get it from the periodic table so where did I get this information from uh, and now we can cover the ideal gas loss. We're almost done here. Uh, a little less than a little less than four hours, but definitely definitely over three. Uh, so here <coughs> we have the ideal gas loss, and we have this new equation here. We call PV equals nRT. So, and I don't want to take a break here because we're, we only got probably about maybe 20 minutes left, so we won't take a break. The ideal gas laws here is PV equals NRT. So we just kind of understand what these variables here represent, right? So P, pretty obvious that we would use that for, for pressure. And we're not going to worry about TOR right now, but we are going to worry about what we call ATM and MMHG. So ATM is actually short for atmospheres, right? So atmospheres is a unit of of pressure, right? If you're at sea level, uh, down at the beach, you're at one atmosphere, right? We're at about 4,000 feet up here, so we're a little bit less than one atmosphere. Uh, and then we talk about this MMHG. This is actually short for millimeter, millimeters of millimeters of mercury. Bell here, let me write that. So that's actually short for millimeters of mercury. If you're in the lab, I do have a, a barometer uh, in the lab. Let me see if I can find one. Uh, barometer, mercury. Mercury barometer. There's got to be an image of it. So in the lab, I have something very similar to uh, oh, that one's not too bad. All right, so let me let me blow this up here. So now.
All right. So down here at the very bottom, this this piece is filled with mercury. And you'll see the see the numbers. They have some some number values here. And what happens is air pressure can be measured in millimeters. So as the air pressure gets uh, higher, the mercury that's in this container gets pushed up into this tube and it goes higher. If the, if the air pressure is lower, then this gets lowered. And we actually are able to measure that in, a, in what we call millimeters. So we use that millimeters of, of mercury there. <clears throat> now, uh, the other units that we have to deal with is, is volume. Right, so we have uh, so volume V for volume, N is the number of moles of gas here. So that is something we're really brand new that it's not really obvious. So N is equal to the number of moles of whatever gas that we have. So the number of moles. Then we have this gas constant. We'll get, well, I'm going to skip the gas constant real quick. We go to T. T obviously for temperature. And now we'll go to the universal gas constant. So this value here will not change for this particular equation here. When we're talking about PV equals NRT is that we say that R is equal to 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres over mole Kelvin. So in order to use this gas constant in our calculations, we need to be able to cancel out units properly. So if you're given a pressure that's in millimeters mercury, you have to convert it to atmospheres. If you're given something in milliliters, convert it to liters. If you're given something in Celsius, convert it to Kelvin. Because we have to be able to match the units in this R constant in order to cancel all these units out. Uh, here we'll get well. Let's do pressure. We could do an example of pressure. Um, I think we're probably at about maybe 600 and we'll say 600 and. Uh, 90, we'll say 690 millimeters of mercury. So if we're at 690 millimeters of mercury, and I want to know how many atmospheres that is, we use this definition here. So we'll say that one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. So here we can cancel out these units. So these millimeters mercury cancel out these millimeters of mercury, uh, and we end up with let's see, 690 divided by 760, and we got 0 0.91. 0 0.91 atmosphere. So it makes about. I mean, it, that makes sense. So we're, we're if sea level is when I'm go ahead and ask mom what I want. Jenna, um, so. If the beach is one atmosphere and we're at 4,000 feet, we're less than one atmosphere. So this is definitely a little bit less than one atmosphere, 0.191 atmospheres. Uh, for those of you that don't remember Kelvin, right? If we if we want to convert to Kelvin and we're given Celsius, we go the degree Celsius plus 273, right? Uh, and that'll give us. So if we had uh, let's see, 70 degrees Celsius, and we wanted to know what Kelvin was. We would add 273 to that, and that one. Oh, hi, sweetie. What? Grandma's downstairs. Go on, go on, go find Mama. All right, sorry about that. Uh, we'd go ahead and add those together, and we would end up.
Sorry, my granddaughters. Uh, all right, so 70 plus 273, uh, we end up with uh, 343 Kelvin, right? Um, <coughs> and this is 70 degrees Celsius. So that's how we convert uh, into Kelvin there. You guys should already know how to convert milliliters to liters or whatnot. Uh, but that way, we can definitely go ahead and use this. I think the only other thing that may occur, we we'll probably see it in one of the examples, is if you're given maybe the mass of a gas, maybe you're given, you know, two grams of helium, right? Well, then you'd have to convert that into moles, and we already have a process in order to do that. So here, uh, let's do a practice problem here. So here we have calculate the volume occupied by 2.5 moles of an ideal gas at 15 degrees Celsius with a pressure 0.75 atmospheres, and you're given the R constant here. In order to solve this, it's asking us to solve for volume, which means that I need to rearrange this equation here. So volume is going to be equal to nRT over P. And this is going to be the formula. So now that I have the right formula, all I have to do is plug in my values. N, the number of moles, 2.5 moles, um, the next is R, so I'm going to multiply that by R, which is 8206 liter atmospheres over mole Kelvin, multiplied by the temperature, the temperature 15 degrees Celsius, what we just learned is we're going to take 15 plus 273, uh, and we get 288. Get, uh, multiply that by 288 Kelvin, and divide that by the pressure of 0.75 atmospheres. And I think that, so that's going to equal uh, 79 liters. Now calculated that answer. So uh, you you are going to be asked to rearrange this, right? Uh, is that you, you have to be comfortable uh, that if we have uh, PV equals NRT, well, if I want to figure out what the temperature is, well, how is the, what's the temperature? Well, that means that I'm going to have PV over NR, and that's going to equal T, right? This is just algebra, right? For those of you that are kind of like, well, how did you get that, right? Don't forget, right? If I divide this by NR, I have to divide this by NR. These cancel out. So this is where I get PV. Right. It's kind of a reminder of that. So now there's a few gas laws that we need to learn now. Um, uh, this is the first one we're going to call Boyle's Law. So Boyle's Law occurs at a constant temperature. And pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So what do we mean by inversely proportional? Well, if we have a constant temperature, and we increase the volume, decrease the pressure, and vice versa. If we decrease the pressure, if we increase the pressure, we decrease the volume, and those are what we consider inversely proportional. So here you'll notice, right, the temperature is constant here, but according to Boyle's law, if I decrease the volume. I increase the temperature. If I increase the volume, I decrease the pressure. So there's an inverse relationship between volume and pressure uh, at constant temperature with what we call Boyle's Law. 
The next one is what we're going to consider Charles law, and this happens at constant pressure. So now there's going to be a relationship between volume and temperature if our pressure happens to remain constant. But this is what we consider a direct relationship. Temperature goes down, volume decreases. Temperature goes up, volume increases. Right? And they just kind of follow along directly. They're directly proportional. One goes up, other one goes up. One goes down, the other one goes down. Right? Um, and that's going to be at what we consider constant temperature. So Charles' law has to deal with, with that relationship between uh, temperature and volume. Then we have Avogadro's law. This one, you know, uh, I think most anybody could figure this out. I, yeah, I could have figured this out, you know. I didn't because I wasn't around back then, but this, you know, this is really just more common sense. I mean, if you have a bottle of water next to you, the bottle of water, like I have a bottle of water next to me, it's got a certain number of moles. Well, if I drink some of it, uh, I decrease the number of moles, right? Which means I decrease the volume, right? If I wanna, if I wanna add water to it, I'm adding more moles of water, which means I'm increasing the volume. And that's, that's pretty much Avogadro's law. And this is done at constant pressure and temperature. So there's no change in pressure, no change in temperature. If I increase the number of moles of my gas, I increase the volume. If I decrease the number of moles of gas, I decrease uh, the volume. And then we just kind of have a, a combination of all. So these are going to be all the equations for Boyle's Charles Law, Combined Gas Law, Avogadro's Law. You can, I will not stop anybody from memorizing all of these. You can absolutely use memorize all these but but i i simply i simply don't is i only use this one here i combine everything that i see here i see uh p1 v1 and what this represents this represents initial so when we put the number one that represents initial and when we put two that represents final so we say P1 V1 equals P2 V2. What we're saying is the initial pressure multiplied by the initial volume will equal the final pressure multiplied by the final volume. So we have P1 V1, and then I put N1 T1. P2, V2, over N2, T2. So you can memorize all of these. Know when to use Boyle's Law, know when to use Charles' Law, know when to use the Combined Gas Law, know when to use Avogadro's Law. Or you can simply just memorize this. All right. Uh, so I'll show you how to use just this one here without having to memorize uh, all of these specific laws. And, I, and I'm not going to ask you what, what's Boyle's law, what's Charles' law. What, I'm not going to ask you to do it. Uh, I'm going to ask you to do calculations on the exam. Right? So in order to, to calculate those uh, is that just remember this one, P1V1 over N1T1 equals P2V2 over N2T2. And that's the only one that you'll need to memorize. So if we take a look at, uh, let's take a look at some problems here. So let's take a look at some problems. All right, so I'm going to use E1, V1, T1, to V2 over N2, T2. A balloon, if I have a balloon, and it's filled with 2.0 liters of gas. I have the balloon. It's filled with this volume, and I know it's volume because it says liters. That is my initial volume, my V1. It's filled with a gas at three atmospheres, which means that must be my initial pressure. And if the pressure is reduced to 0.5 atmospheres, that must be the final pressure, 
without a change in temperature or let's try and understand a math concept here. If I were to type, if I were to write P times S times T equals P times S times Q. Well, if these numbers are identical, I don't need P and I don't need S and I get T equals Q. Because if they're identical, they just are simply gonna cancel each other out. So when we're looking and, and reading these without a change in temperature or moles, which means that my initial temperature and my final temperature are exactly the same. My initial moles and my final moles are the same that in order to figure this out, I need P1 V1 equals P2 V2. Or you can memorize Boyle's law and go, oh, I know what I need here. I need Boyle's law. I won't stop you from memorizing those. All right, so what would the volume of the balloon be? So what we're looking for is we're looking for V2. which means that I need to rearrange this to solve for V2. So I'm going to put P1 V1 over P2 is equal to V2. And that's just a simple, that's just algebra here. Uh, regardless if you memorize it, you still have to rearrange these equations. So there's no, there's no getting away from that. <clears throat> I'm going to put all my values in. P1 is equal to three atmospheres. V1 is equal to 2.0 liters. And P2 is equal to 0.5 atmospheres. So then we're just going to go ahead and simply uh, solve this. Uh, let's cancel out our units here. Atmospheres cancel atmosphere. 3 times 2 is 6. 6 divided by 0.5, and we get 12. Uh, let's look at another problem. A uh, 600 milliliter sample of nitrogen is heated from 27 degrees Celsius to 77 degrees Celsius at constant pressure in moles. Constant pressure, constant number of moles. Well, if we're using P1, V1, T1 equals V2 over N2, T2, constant pressure, which means that value doesn't change and the constant number of moles, which means that value doesn't change, which means that my formula here is V1 T1 equals V2 T2. Or you can memorize all four and know that you have to use Charles' law. <clears throat> In order to figure these out, do not ever forget this. Celsius is a problem in these equations simply because Celsius can go into the negative. If, if this was minus 10 degrees and minus 20 degrees, is that I'm going to end up with a negative volume. That's one issue. The other issue is what if one of these values was zero? Can I divide anything by zero? No, I, this is not even, uh, you can't, we can't even solve it. I could put zero divided by two, but I can't put two divided by zero. We can't divide anything by zero. It's not possible. So we do have to convert that to Celsius. So uh, we have 273 plus 27 and 273 plus 77. Uh, so here we're going to have uh, 300, and this would be 350 Kelvin. All right, what's the final volume? What is the final volume? 
let me rearrange this real quick. T2 times V1 T1 is two. Right. This is uh, just algebra, right? Multiply this by T2, cancels out, multiply this by T2, and we get we get our solution here. All right, so now I'm just going to plug in all these values. Uh, this is going to be heated from 27. So this was my T1. This is my T2. So T2 says 350 degrees Kelvin times the initial volume of 600 milliliters divided by the initial temperature, 300. <coughs> And we get, let's see, 350, 600 divided by 350, nope, divided by 300, equals 700, so I guess the final, <coughs> excuse me, I guess the final thing we need to know is, <coughs> Excuse me. How do you know when to use how do you know when to use this and how do you know when to use PV equals NRT? How am I gonna know, Alex? How am I possibly gonna know that? When we're talking about PV equals NRT, we're not asking for any changes. You'll notice in the in the problem, it'll say, this is the volume, this is the pressure, this is the temperature. What's the number of moles? What's the volume? What's the pressure? What's the temperature? It's not asking you for final temperature, initial temperature. It's not talking about any changes. It's that if I look at this problem here and I go, okay, well, I, I already noticed right off the bat, look at this. I see two different temperatures. If I see two different temperatures, I'm going to need to use this. I can't figure out two temperatures here. So in these problems here, right? I'm I'm looking at this. You know, uh, I see the word change here. I see this temperature. I see this temperature. I see this atmosphere. I see this atmosphere. <sighs> And if I see a, excuse me, cough is getting to me here. If I see a different number like that, I know that this is just not, PV equals NRT is not going to work. PV equals NRT is when I'm looking for something specific about a gas. Here's the gas at this temperature, this number of moles, this price. Calculate this for me. So those are just kind of keywords that you're going to look for. If, if it says decrease, change, final, initial, this isn't going to work for you. You need to use your gas laws in order to calculate that out. Okay. All right. So I think that will cover it. All right. So we are done with unit four.